uh, and a research advisor for the Global Peace Foundation, and I'll be your moderator for the first session here. Um, we have a very uh, ambitious uh, and imaginative agenda to discuss here today. Um, this forum is put together on the premise that the focus on North Korea and the crisis caused uh, by North Korea's pursuit of nuclear weapons capable of reaching the United States has created an opportunity to step back and take a much broader look at uh, policy towards North Korea and the Korean Peninsula as a whole. And in this forum, we're going to be exploring various aspects of those possibilities. Uh, we're very grateful uh, for the uh, sponsors and co-conveners of this forum, uh, Global Peace Foundation, Action for Korea United, One Korea Foundation, uh, East-West Institute, and the National Unification Advisory Council. Uh, a couple of those organizations uh, have represent representatives who will now come up and give welcoming remarks. So first I'd like to call to the podium uh, Mr. James Flynn, who is the international president of the Global Peace Foundation. Please welcome Mr. Flynn. Good afternoon, and welcome to the United States Senate here in the Dirksen Hearing Room. It is a very uh, important for us to join together in this very prestigious venue to discuss critical issues, the most critical issues facing our world today, uh, with the crisis and, and uh, division on the Korean Peninsula. On behalf of the Global Peace Foundation and our co-conveners, welcome to our forum, uh, International Forum on One Korea. Uh, let me thank especially our co-conveners. Uh, first, the East-West Institute, represented here by the Chief Operating Officer, Dr. William Parker, and Mr. Robert uh, Campbell from their Board of Directors. Secondly, the One Korea Foundation. Uh, here we'll, you'll hear uh, briefly, uh, uh, shortly, uh, from its president, Dr. Uh, Jay Ryu. Uh, also, Action for Korea United. Uh, many of you are delegates uh, from Korea, from Action for Korea United. We greatly appreciate your co-convening here in this forum. Also partnering with us is the uh, Republic of Korea National Unification Advisory Council and the Unification Education Committee of the Greater Washington Area. Our forum here is unique and important. We are addressing very critical issues. Uh, because of the importance of the relationship between the United States and the Republic of Korea, our forum here, first of all, has an important, unique element. We are convening here on November 14 and 15 in Washington, D.C. We are actually continuing our discussions as a second part of our larger forum in Seoul, Korea on December 7 and 8. Another unique element and, and important uh, aspect of our convening and discussions here. Uh, there are forums every day in Washington, D.C. among policy experts and scholars. Uh, however, uh, this forum uh, takes a very unique approach because we recognize the critical importance of engaging multi-sector leadership. Not only government, but also civil society not only think tank experts, but also practitioners uh, from uh, every part of society. We're very grateful to have here uh, from the Republic of Korea a very prestigious delegation of National Assembly members. I'd like to recognize Honorable Jung Kool Lee, Honorable Song Jin Shin, Honorable Song Jin Min Lee, Honorable Young Kyo So, Honorable Jae So Oh, and Honorable Chan Wo Park. Uh, if you please give applause for the National Assembly members who have joined us. And likewise, we have an important delegation uh, of, of 40 leaders from around the Republic of Korea who are working in their communities and, and regions within Korea on this noble cause for unification. We greatly appreciate their participation here. Uh, we expect to have some very stimulating and important okay, applause for the representatives from Action for Korea United. We expect very important discussions this afternoon. We greatly appreciate your participation. Thank you very much as we begin our forum. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Flynn. Um, before inviting up our next uh, welcomer, I'd like to acknowledge 
uh, the support of Senator Ted Cruz, who sponsored this room so that we could meet here in, in, in the Dirksen building, uh, and who has a, a, a deep and abiding interest uh, in Korea and the future resolution of the current Korean situation. I'd now like to call up uh, our second welcomer, representing the One Korea Foundation, uh, Dr. Jaepung sorry, Dr. Jaepung Ryu. Uh, he's Emeritus Professor of Loyola University, Maryland. When he retired in 2012, instead of going fishing, he founded the One Korea Foundation uh, in order to bring to uh, Americans a greater understanding of Korea, Korean issues, and the need for unification. Please welcome Dr. Ryu. Sure. Please consider the, what Mr. Jim Flynn said has been said again, so I'm not repeating what he said, the welcoming and special thanks and so on. The, uh, instead, I will just talk about one thing. We just came from Lincoln Cottage where the concept of vision was very much stressed. And, uh, we will all talk about vision somehow in different panels that is to unfold from now on. It's, uh, vision is very important. It's not just some abstract concept that uh, is very remote from the real things we have to deal with in life, but rather it has a real ramification with what we do. Someone said that the, act, the action without vision is, uh, is a nightmare, is a chaos. Vision without action is a hypocrisy. It is a, it's a daydream. And I agree with that. And we talked about how at Lincoln Cottage that it was the clear vision Abraham Lincoln had to sustain the principles by which the Republic was founded, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution that followed it. And we also need the vision. So I was going to say something about what I think should be the vision, what United Korea must look like. But I didn't have to do that. I'm no fan of President Trump, but I found one Donald Trump I can really love. He gave a talk at the National Assembly in Korea only last week, and he, I think, fairly clearly defined the vision. He did so by not talking about unification or vision, the word of vision itself, but he, talked, he put this Korean history into something of a historic, even almost a biblical experiment. Half of Korea went one way, the northern half of Korea went the other way, and we spent 70 years separate. And then now the dice has been cast and results are in. There's no more need to manufacture a new vision. The vision is already here, and the, the kind of country we will have that uh, Donald Trump talked about, strong, independent, uh, democratic, human rights respecting, uh, peaceful nation, you know, inconsistent with uh, Korea's tradition. We never invaded anybody. So, that is the vision itself. So we now challenge everybody who will speak this session, do you or do you not agree with this vision? And actually, when I heard President Trump talk in Korea, he mentioned Korean dream. And I thought also I sensed something of a hint of an influence of Dr. Edwin Fulner in Donald Trump's speech. Dr. Fulner is not here, I cannot thank him, but I thank Preston Moon for the Korean dream. The, uh, he has a vision, and he has a courage and stamina to pursue it. The, uh, so the speakers and the uh, debaters, presenters of this session, please put this on part of your agenda to address, that is, do we agree with this vision of uh, Korea? that looks much more like South Korea than North Korea, but much better than South Korea of today. So it, is, it will have to be a new Korea that uplifts everybody, some more than others, but it should be uplifting for Koreans of the South, Koreans of the North, 
and all its neighbors around. So that's a nation strong and independent and democratic, market-oriented economy. Uh, do you have any problem with that vision? If you do, please let it be out through this conference so that we can deal with it. Let's debate and whether that is the right vision or not. If it is, let us get united about this. And if we, if we agree, then let us think about how to achieve it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Yu, uh, and especially for introducing the important concept of, of, of vision. Uh, he mentioned this morning the visit to the Lincoln Cottage of our visiting uh, Korean members of Congress and the AKU delegation. The Lincoln Cottage was where President Lincoln drafted the Emancipation Procl Proclamation. So when we speak of vision, it's strongly connected with human dignity and human rights which is a perfect cue for our next speaker, our first main panelist, Greg Scarlatu, who is the executive director of the Committee for Human Rights in North Korea, which I think I can say without contradiction uh, is the foremost organization in the United States uh, promoting human rights in North Korea. Um, Greg is, uh, uh, ha has served as an expert witness frequently uh, at he uh, congressional hearings on human rights in North Korea writes and broadcasts widely, uh, particularly uh, the weekly Scarlatu column to North Korea, uh, part of that process of increasing information flowing into North Korea, um, and is an expert on the subject who has his own experience of dictatorship and freedom from it as a young man in uh, Romania, where he was born and grew up and witnessed the overthrow of the, overthrow of the Ceausescu regime. Please welcome. Mr. Greg Scarlatu. Michael, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, delighted to see you here today. My mission is to provide you with a uh, brief update on the human rights situation in North Korea. This uh, was mentioned by Dr. Ryu earlier. I think that um, the speech uh, given by President Trump before the South Korean National Assembly last week provided comprehensive coverage of South Korea, including the miracle on the River Han, the astounding economic, political, social development undergone by South Korea, and also the central themes that are key to understanding the human rights situation in North Korea. Most countries in the region, South Korea in particular, have benefited from decades of tremendous economic, social, political development. North Korea today continues to remain a black hole on the map of Northeast Asia. Uh, this is a country that in the 21st century is still running a political prison camp system where up to 120,000 men, women, and children are held pursuant to a system of guilt by association, a feudal inspiration called Yonjaje. This is a country that is still discriminating against its own people, classifying them based on their perceived loyalty to the regime and the perceived loyalty of their relatives pursuant to a system of social discrimination called Songbun. Um, our research, you may wonder, uh, what is our research methodology? We conduct extensive interviews with North Korean escapees since the days of the Great Famine, since the mid-1990s when uh, anywhere between 600,000 and 3 million North Koreans starved to death or died of disease induced by malnutrition, many more North Koreans have escaped. There are 31,000 of them living in South Korea today. There are others living in other countries, including here in the United States, more than 200. Uh, they have provided a key testimony that has enabled us to understand the human rights situation in North Korea. We um, 
also benefit from technological developments uh, when it comes to investigating the political prison camps. We use satellite imagery and satellite imagery analysis. We corroborate witness testimony with satellite imagery. Um, we have developed the, the capability of contacting sources inside the country with the help of colleagues in South Korea and beyond, contacted on a combination of North Korean cell phone, smuggled Chinese cell phone. Based on that, uh, under the rule, under the regime of Kim Jong-un, we have identified several trends. One of these is an aggressive crackdown on attempted defections. As many of you know, the number of North Koreans escaping to South Korea stood at about 2,800 a year up to 2011. Ever since Kim Jong-un took over, that number has declined by 50% at about 1,500 a year or lower. And that is certainly not because the situation suddenly improved overnight. It is because of an intensified crackdown. The political prison camp system has been in flux. Facilities close to the border with China have been shut down uh, because it was bad PR for the regime that's beginning to pay attention to international efforts. Remember, in February 2014, a UN Commission of Inquiry found that crimes against humanity are being committed pursuant to policies established at the highest level of the state. Um, other facilities Inland have been expanded uh, in the case of uh, Camp 25, uh, for example, uh, in, um, in uh, Tongjin, North Korea. Uh, that facility has expanded by uh, about 100%, twofold. Camp 14 is documented by Amnesty International, my own organization. So prisoners were moved to other facilities in the process. In the process of shutting down Camp 22, close to the border with China, for example, thousands went missing, they disappeared. To this day, we don't know what happened to them, but we fear the worst. Another trend that we have identified is disproportionate repression of women. As all of you or many of you know, after North Korea experienced a great famine, North Korea has undergone an uh, informal marketization process. Um, the most active agents at these markets are women, in particular married women, because married women no longer have to spend as much time engaged in public mobilization campaigns. So for that reason, it is primarily women who are arrested for perceived wrongdoing at these markets and subsequently imprisoned. It is particularly women who cross the border into China without government permission are arrested, forcibly repatriated to a credible fear of persecution, conditions of danger in direct violation of the 1951 UN Refugee Convention to which China is a party. We have documented this based on witness testimony and satellite imagery. At one particular re-education through labor camp, camp number 12 in Chonggori, North Hamgyong province, out of 1,000 women prisoners, 80%, 800 of them, are women arrested and forcibly repatriated from China. Of course, another trend that you're all aware of is the, uh, the purges that have been ongoing since early 2009. Uh, that's when North Korea began preparing for the second hereditary transmission of power. Representatives of all fundamental building blocks of the regime have been purged. The Korean People's Army, the internal security agencies, uh, the Korean Workers' Party, even the inner core of the Kim family regime. Of course, the leaders of North Korea are not irrational, they're not insane, they're criminal. Again, remember the findings of the UN Commission of Inquiry. Uh, and yet, if one asks um, about Kim Jong-un and his mental state, all one has to know is that he had his own uncle executed with a ZPU-4 anti-aircraft machine gun system, four machine gun barrels, automatic fire, 50 caliber bullets, 
14.5 millimeter for those used to the metric system. Bodies are simply pulverized. He also had his half-brother assassinated with a weapon of mass destruction, VX binary agent used at a busy international airport in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, according to the Seoul-based Institute for National Security Strategy, INSS. This is an institute st staffed with uh, many senior North Korean defectors. Only during the first five years of the Kim regime, 340 senior officials were purged or executed. Remember, this is a humongous bureaucracy. It's not only one single individual. It's the entire bureaucratic support structure that's taken out from underneath, together with associates, family members. The extent of the purges is on par with the great purges of the 1950s when Kim Il-sung, Kim Jong-un's brother, was eliminating rival factions, the pro-Chinese faction, the pro-Soviet faction, and others. Um, so, of course, uh, the, the question that we often hear is, what is there to do? Well, first of all, we have to remember that we are often outcompeted. We are outcompeted by very important issues, North Korea's nuclear weapons and ballistic missiles. We are often outcompeted by other human rights crises, the, the refugee crisis in the Mediterranean basin, the refugee crisis in South Asia, and yet we must face the challenge and keep North Korean human rights at the top of the agenda. The 25 million people of North Korea must not be forgotten, excepting the elites. Uh, up to 23 million of them live under abysmal conditions. The, the difference between the capital city of Pyongyang and those living outside the capital city is, if you will, the difference between living in suburban northern Virginia and some godforsaken corner, if I may say so, of the third world. So what is there to do? I think that what we can do, surely, is to apply all elements of national power. And uh, of course, as, uh, as we can see, um, in terms of military power, the United States is emphasizing the strength and importance of our alliances with our friends, allies, and partners in South Korea, in Japan, the importance of trilateral coordination amongst the three countries. Um, in terms of application of economic power, we have a sanctions regime in place. The sanctions regime pursuant to UN Security Council resolutions is not meant to hurt the people of North Korea. It is meant to prevent the development and proliferation of nuclear weapons and ballistic missiles. Of course, there might be some side effects in the process. This is the case with most sanctions regimes. Uh, some of those who drafted our own North Korea Human Rights Act here in the United States, North Korea um, Policy and Sanctions Enforcement Act here in the United States, went through great pains to make sure that there is no humanitarian impact on the people of North Korea. Do the sanctions work? They need more time to be tested. Um, of course, uh, there is a diplomatic element of national power. I will never speak against diplomacy, being a student of diplomacy myself, but diplomacy based on a realistic understanding of North Korea, on an understanding that this is a regime that has breached each and every international agreement it had, a regime that has zero credibility. But from our viewpoint as human rights organizations, I think that the most important element of national power that can be applied is the power of information. After all, true change can only come from the people of North Korea themselves. The best we can do is to empower them through information from the outside world. We know that more radio broadcasting, USBs, memory chips are getting into the country. We need to tell the people of North Korea three fundamental stories the story of their own human rights situation, which they do not understand, living under a tyrannical regime, the story of the corruption of their own leaders, in particular the corruption of the Kim family, and the story of the outside world, in particular 
the story of free, prosperous, democratic, economic powerhouse, South Korea, the Republic of Korea. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Scarlatu. Um, very timely reminders of, first of all, the power of information, uh, and secondly, right in line with the focus of this forum, that we not get caught in tunnel vision to focus only on nuclear weapons and military threats, but use this opportunity to look at the Korean situation in the widest perspective, uh, which includes, of course, the human rights of the oppressed people of North Korea. Um, well, these forums are also an opportunity for exchange between uh, Americans and American organizations uh, and, and South Korea. And we're very happy to welcome a, a number of uh, South Korean uh, National Assembly members. And I'd like to call upon uh, our first speaker from Korea, the Honorable Lee Jong-kul, uh, who is a five-term member of the National Assembly and was a former floor leader of the Minju Party. Uh, previously, he was also a senior executive of the URI Party. Uh, he's president of the Korea-China Cultural Association uh, and currently is serving as a member of the, the Defense Committee. He joined us back in July for an earlier forum, and we're very happy to welcome him back here to Washington. Please welcome the Honorable Lee. Good afternoon. In July this year, I participated in forum to come up with a strategy and plan for peace and unification on the Korean Peninsula together with all of you who are here today. I am very pleased to discuss the new future of the Korean Peninsula with you once again. I would like to express my deepest gratitude to the Glo Global Peace Foundation, East West Institute, Action for Korean United and One Korea Foundation, and Dr. Moon Hyun Jin, who organized this forum. I would also like to thank my colleague, Korean lawmaker, who joined the forum amid their busy schedule. And leaders of Korean civil society uh, who visited the U.S. at the time. It has been only four months since we had the first discussion in July, but the situation surrounding the Korean Peninsula has changed a lot. Back in July, the military tensions on the Korean Peninsula reached its pitch due to a series of uh, Korean North Korea's missile and nuclear weapon test, but it is coming up to a state of a ruler. Why the democratic and defense policy of the newly established Moon Jae-in government seemed un unclear in July. Now we have a main stand for the development of a Korea-US alliance and strategic balance diplomacy. Why there was a possible conflict between Korea and the U.S. and the concern about the weakening of Korea-U.S. military cooperation as President Trump's and to Korea proved, we are now seeing the intensified Korea-U.S. joint response to the North Korea's threat. Why the international cooperation for the North Korea on the issue became difficult due to the frigid relation between Korea and China in July. The Korean-China strategy partnership is now being restored. However, it is not that the Korean Peninsula has entered a path of peace and reconciliation. The military provocation and diplomatic threat by the North are still continuing. 
Such a serious situation has brought expert from Korea and the U.S. together here today to seek a solution to ease tensions. Ambrose Bierce, a famous writer, American, has left a famous thing in the international issues. Peace is a period in between the two worlds to deceive each other. There is no other thing that more perfectly fits his saying that North Korea's military problem. In terms of the inter-Korean relations, peace has been the temporary period in between the acceleration of Korean military power and next accelerations. Our the Minju government will tackle the North Korea's nuclear weapon and missile threat wisely through lesson learned from the cynical rhetoric of peers. There are a series of conflicting options in front of the Republic of Korea as follows. Korea-led self-defense versus the acceleration of Korea-U.S. alliance, securing the independence and nuclear deterrent versus the denuclearization of the Korean peninsula, peaceful co-opers co Perry by the reconciliation and cooperation between the two Korea versus the chain of the North Korean regime. A balanced strategy for the US, China, Japan, Russia versus the enhanced of the joint military community of Korea. The US and Japan, these options appear to the contradictory and it either or what issue. The national interest of Korea and allied countries could collide. However, our the Minju government are going to tackle such a tangled challenge through the broad support, broad support of our people and the normalization of relations with neighboring countries. Lastly, I have one thing to emphasize. That is the U.S. cooperation for military buildup of South Korea. Why? While there was a lot of demand for the nuclear armament of Korea, South Korea, or the introduction of tactical nuclear weapons as a contempt measures for the intensified North Korea's nuclear missile provocation. Korea has op opted to enhance the expanded deterrence strategy along with the United States. There are many difficulties in responding to nuclear weapons with conventional weapons. The most security and cheapest response to nu nuclear weapons is to possess them. The United States should support such a difficult choice of the Moon Jae-in government in a practical way. In this end, we need your support to implement the challenge of revising the Korea-US missile agreement, which restricts the ballistic missile range and the nuclear energy agreement, which does not allow nuclear reprocessing facilities together in less proper and constructive ways. In addition, in order to balance our military power with that of North Korea, I ask you your strong support to help Korea acquire and develop sophisticated military assets, including F-35A, Flighter, AH-64, Apache helicopter, Global Hawk High Altitude Online, civilian vehicle, and the easiest combat system, which are strictly 
controlled by the U.S. Congress. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Honorable Lee. Uh, I think from his remarks you can understand very clearly uh, the pressure that the current situation is putting on, on, on the South Korean government uh, and the uh, natural response to want to increase their uh, defensive and military capacities. Um, in this forum, uh, we're looking to explore uh, alternatives to being narrowly locked into that type of military tit-for-tat. Not, not saying that that is not something that must be considered, um, but looking at wider options also. Uh, the Honorable Lee is a, a representative and a member of the governing party, um, the Minju Party. Our next speaker from Korea, uh, the Honorable Shin Sang-jin, is a member representative of the main opposition party, the Liberty Korea Party. He's a four-term member of the National Assembly of Korea uh, and was a former chairman of the policy, uh, governing policy committee. He's a medical doctor by training and is president of the Korea Medical Association also. Please welcome the Honorable Shin. Good afternoon. Distinguished guests of uh, the International Forum on One Korea and ladies and gentlemen, I wholeheartedly Welcome all of you. My name is Shin Sang Jin, the chairman of the Science ICT Broadcasting and Communications Committee of the National Assembly of the Republic of Korea. I belong to opposition party, Liberty Korea Party. Today, uh, along with me, six other National Assembly members and 40 civic organization presidents who work for the unification of the Korean Peninsula are attending this symposium. I am certain that everyone is here because collectively we desire the unification of the Korean Peninsula and world peace. As the Korean Peninsula remains trapped in a crisis spiral due to the North nuclear issues, it is the timely move to hold the International Forum on One Korea, both in Washington, D.C. and Seoul, led by civic society around the world as part of an effort to address the crisis. The 21st century in a mature democracy is an era of government by the people and for the people. In this age, the power of the citizens can change government policy and spread across the international community, com community going beyond national borders. As you are well aware, nuclear development by the North is the biggest barrier posing threat to the peace and security of the world. Without resolving this issue, the world will be unable to move forward into the first 21st century peacefully. The Korean Peninsula's problem is also the world's problem. The destiny of the Korean Peninsula is directly linked to the world's destiny. As the peace of the world is seriously threatened by the North's nuclear ambitions, it is high time that the inter international community raise a voice in unison based on uh, consensus on the necessity of addressing the nuclear issues of North and the unification of the Korean Peninsula. International consensus on the unification of the Co Korean Peninsula can be reached when the international community reaches an agreed vision of the unification and joins hands to help make that vision a reality overcoming the old Cold War mindset. To this end, conscientious, uh, conscientious uh, political leaders who seek peace and work for the realization of the universal human values around the world and civic society must play a leading role. 
because civic society in particular affects the establishment and implementation of national policy, any, any civic organizations that are willing to play a part should cooperate and make collaborated, collaborative efforts. As a statement, I would like to emphasize the historical significance that will be brought about by the unification of the peninsula. Human history has evolved to enhance human freedom and rights and spread political democracy. The speed of improvement and spread has been accelerated in the 21st century. The, the Arab Spring, which won the sympathy of the world several years ago, is the extremely case of enthusiasm from people who pursue the protection of human freedom and rights as well as democracy. It is uh, no turn to undergo such a historical change. The region must uh, leave open the door for the North Korea people to enjoy authentic freedom, human rights, and democracy. The international community must feel morally obliged to cooperate to solve this issue. We must hold, we must hold the North back from developing nuclear weapons and at the same time make an effort to reform North Korea society and pursue unification. This is because the North has nuclear ambitions that stem from reasons other than protecting the regime from external threats. North Korea takes advantage of its uh, nuclear development to suppress international complaints and unite its people while, while causing tension and confrontation with the external world. All this is aimed at maintaining a regime that has been set up based on, on uh, the undemocratic uh, hereditary succession system. In this sense, it will not be easy for the U.S. to talk the Kim Jong-un regime into give up, giving up its nuclear ambitions without reforming North Korean society. The problem is that the regime believes that introducing social changes is that also with its survival. As hard as it has been for the regime to accept China's reforms and its opening up, it will be all the more difficult for it to give up its nuclear development, the last resort, and become a responsible member of the international community. As a result, the world community has adopted, adopted uh, economic and diplomatic sanctions and applied various forms of pressure, except for military options that target North Korea. We do not know how effective this will be. Therefore, one of the desired measures, I believe, is the redeployment of tech tactical nuclear weapons on the Korean Peninsula. This would, read, this would lead the North to dial down its nuclear development and proliferation ambitions and ultimately make the Korean Peninsula a more peaceful, stable place without nuclear weapons. I believe members of the international community should cooperate in a more active manner, going beyond the UN's sanctions and pressure. Civic society should take the lead in making efforts to inform North Korean people of their reality and achieve change in North Korean society with international col collaboration. In addition to the redeployment of tactical nuclear weapons, Providing North Korea with information on the outside world is another effective way to make them aware of their current predicament. 
According to some sources familiar with the North Korean situation, the Korean wave has already become widespread in the North. Even though the South pop culture, pop culture, including songs, fashion, and drama, is now mainstream, the content needs to make people in the North aware of their current predicament and education, educate them has not been spread. As North Korean defectors who are achieve activities to note, the Korean wave has come up against the limits of North Korean society. Therefore, international society should engage in a collaborative effort. We need to provide quality content and spread external information in the North. By doing so, we can enlighten North Koreans and enable them to shape their own destiny of they take advantage of their democratic rights to reform their society. North Korea should give up its nuclear program to achieve this, it is a priority that the whole world cooperate. When North Korea gives up nuclear program, it is important that South of Korea, together with several nations, provide economic support, including establishment of, uh, of special economic zone. In this regard, the International Forum on One Korea, led by civic society on a global sense, is meaningful on many levels, as it has a series of sessions over different areas under the theme of the peace and unification of the Korean Peninsula. It is particularly Note to us that we are going to discuss the spread of information on the outside world during the session under the theme of improving humanitarian aid and increasing human rights of, for North Korea. We need to take this opportunity to call for coherent commitment among political authorities around the world and action by global civic society in order to brace for the North nuclear threat to the world. Above all, we must seek measures for common security in Northeast Asia and world peace in an attempt to overcome security threats caused by the North nuclear ambitions. Diplomacy is an important means to address conflict and tension across the globe. However, it is more important that citizens support relevant government policy and that such policy wins the sympathy and cooperation of members of the international community. This forum will provide an opportunity for civic society and art activists in the private sector to appear to the international community and win the sympathy of its, of its members based on One Korea initiative. They will understand the only option left for the two Koreas and the members of the international community is achieve peace and unification of the Korean, Korean Peninsula. Only then can they solve the those nuclear issues at a fundamental level and make the world a more peaceful place in the interest of all people. I hope this forum will show members of the international community the right way to realize the peace and unification of the Korean Peninsula and the, take the first hopeful step towards peace in Northeast Asia and the world. Once again, I'd like to express my gratitude 
to the foundation for warmly welcoming us and for all the preparation and effort that went into organizing this meaningful event. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Shin. Um, he, he reminded us that uh, North Korea is not just a Korean or even a regional problem, but a world problem, uh, and therefore the importance of international cooperation uh, to address that problem, uh, including uh, cooperation at a, at a civil society level as well as on the government level. Uh, he reminded us also of the importance of information uh, in bringing about change in any society, he gave the example of the Arab Spring, uh, and, and particularly uh, the importance of information in the future in North Korea. He mentioned social change in North Korea. Social change is happening now in, in, in North Korea through information flows and through the markets. Not to say that North Korea is on the verge of a revolution, but these changes once begun, uh, we cannot predict where they might end. So thank you again, uh, Honorable Shin, for your remarks. Uh, our, next, uh, our next speaker is Dr. William Parker, who's the Chief Operating Officer of the East-West Institute, which does uh, a lot of quiet, um, at the coalface type of work in Track 2 and Track 1.5 meetings and forums um, in, in some of the hotspots of the world with countries that are of concern to the United States. Uh, he's a former... Uh, U.S. Navy officer with a distinguished career, achieving flag rank. Uh, he's the author of a, a, a much perused book um, by practitioners uh, and observers of national security issues. It's called Guaranteeing America's Security in the 21st Century. Please welcome Dr. Parker. Thank you very much to this esteemed body. It's a pleasure to be here and an honor to be here with all of you today. I offer for your consideration that the Korean Peninsula of 2017 is an opportunity and not a crisis. This moment in time offers first an opportunity to significantly decrease the suffering of more than 25 million North Koreans. Second, an opportunity for the Korean people to reunite once again. Third, an opportunity for the entire peninsula to share the many blessings of a democracy. Fourth, an opportunity to once and for all eliminate all nuclear weapons from the peninsula and serve as an example for the rest of the world to follow. Fifth, an opportunity for China to set and act a part of a great power or choose to act as a closed nation. Sixth, an opportunity for the United States to continue in its role as a global power and a global leader. And finally, seventh, an opportunity for North Korea to join the world of responsible nations through direct talks between the United States and North Korea. These seven aspirations, while lofty, are certainly achievable in short order. The alternative of war on the Korean Peninsula or a fully nuclear North Korea are both fully unacceptable. 25 million North Koreans currently live in the world, and can, or, a world that is considered unfathomable by most everyone in this room today. Limited outside contact, severe restrictions on internal communications and access to the internet, hunger, state mandated jobs, brutal responses to anyone making disparaging marks about the political leadership, and the list goes on and on. In 2013, the gross domestic product of North Korea was estimated at $33 billion, while South Korea was at $1.19 trillion. The GDP per capita was $33,200 in South Korea. In North Korea, it was $1,800. And by 2013, South Korea's inside uh, uh, trade volume was an impressive $1.017 trillion. This massive disparity of wealth, education, and freedoms 
will eventually lead to a unified Korea or less likely a transition of the current Kim Jong-un regime. And there are experts in this room who have spent a lifetime studying this issue, a citizen-driven movement for reunification by an organization known as the Action for One Korea focuses on the Koreans' dreams foundation principle of uplifting human rights and dignity, serving as a foundation for shared vision that can uni uh, unite the Korean people and serve as a new paradigm that advances world peace and human prosperity. We have an opportunity for the entire peninsula to share the many blessings of a democracy. The significant differences between the quality of life in East and West Germany is magnified many times in the case of these two similarly cleaved neighboring countries of which shared in the blessings of democracy, the, the South Koreans, and one in which is ruled by dictators, North Korea. And while the variance in quality of life may be seen in differences between the GDPs of East and West Germany, a one to seven ratio, South Korea to North Korea is a 40 to one ratio. Like the Germany issue, this will be a significant initial cost to the world, a financial burden. But I offer that it is one well worth the world's efforts from a moral, economic, and security perspective. Right now, we have an opportunity to once and for all eliminate all nuclear weapons from the peninsula and serve as an example for the rest of the world. The issue of a nuclear North Korea goes well beyond the Kim Jong-un regime. Consider this, and some of you in this room may not agree with me, but if North Korea is allowed to continue its nuclear weapons program, the Japanese and South Koreans will be forced to build advanced nuclear weapons programs of their own. For both Japan and South Korea, this nuclear program will provide a type of mutually assured destruction paradigm which should prevent even the most radical thinking dictators from, being, from using these weapons against other nations. But it doesn't stop there. If Japan becomes nuclear, China will undoubtedly feel a need to expand its weapon systems. In the meanwhile, Iran and other nations will watch the North Korea as they get their way, develop a nuclear program, and threatening world peace, and you may well see a proliferation into the Gulf states and other building their own systems in the coming decade. So, why does all this matter to the average global citizen? because we will lose control of fissile material. It's that simple. And if you think 9-11 was bad, see what happens if we lose fissile control over the fissile material in the world today. This is an opportunity also for China to act as a part of a great power or to choose to continue to act as a closed nation. China faces a complex scenario in their own backyard. They are concerned with, the United, with a united Korea that was resemble the affluent and widely successful democracy of South Korea, a close ally to the United States. If the unification occurs, there is no longer a geographic buffer between the South Koreans and China. But if China does nothing, they are likely left with a nuclear North Korea, a nuclear Japan, a nuclear South Korea, and possibly combat operations that could go nuclear on the peninsula. China saw the impact on nations like Turkey when four million refugees flooded their nation of 80 million people. A major war on the peninsula will be many times greater and with the potential of nuclear, chemical, and biological weapons being used and drifting into the Chinese airspace. And even if none of those likely WMD after effects impact China, imagine the impact on their economy as shipping lanes were shut down and logistics grind to a near standstill in the region. China's tenuous civilian chi banking system could quickly falter and impact the remainder of their economy in ways we do not wish to think about. And by the way, think about the impact of China on the rest of the global economy. The 2017 Korea Pen Peninsula is an opportunity for the United States to continue in its role as a global leader. The United States remains positioned to be that indispensable nation in the world. No other nation is better prepared to facilitate an outcome on the peninsula that will not threaten the next generation's way of life. 
I am not implying that the United States should act alone in any way. But if those actions with the most to lose, those nations with the most to lose, do not act, I think it is America's role to lead, diplomatically, economically, morally, and if all else fails, militarily. And finally, it's an opportunity for North Korea to join the world of responsible nations through direct talks between the United States and North Korea. This is an opportunity for the United States to take leadership role and no longer rely on third parties to negotiate on America's behalf. The United States must communicate directly to North Korea through official channels to clearly articulate the options on the table for North Korea. These must be a clear, there must be a clear path to survival for the nation of North Korea and the current regime. Similarly, there must be a clear path to their demise if certain actions are not taken in a very specific period of time. So, in closing, this is a complex problem with very real solutions. The United States must lead, the Chinese must lead, follow or get out of the way, and North Korea must be presented options that could result in their survival without nuclear weapons. If these steps are taken, North Korea will eventually melt away and become united with a much more successful South Korea and the world will be better for the changes. I open today with an assertion that the Korean Peninsula of 2017 is an opportunity, not a crisis. This historical moment presents a unique opportunity precisely because it looks and feels so much like a crisis. The properties of substances and nations can change under extreme heat and pressure. After more than six decades of diplomatic stagnation, an unprecedented nexus of factors have brought us to this moment when the heat and pressure are high. The bright focus of the global political community is directed at this problem. It's hot and the components of this long-standing problem are changing, and changing fast. And that means that this is a unique opportunity for a meaningful change that simply could not have happened under other leadership than ours, and then on also of yours. Or at another time in this past 64 years than today. This is an opportunity for the United States to lead while the nations of the region simultaneously take the opportunity and the responsibility for their futures. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Dr. Parker. Uh, once again, with your accustomed clarity, uh, you laid out at the situation um, very compellingly. Uh, maybe frightened us all a little bit, but at least you put the facts there on the table. Uh, and made very clear what the nations in the region plus the United States um, have to lose, what the consequences might be of not bringing about a resolution uh, in the near to midterm to this situation. So thank you again. Uh, by the way, I think those seven points, probably a lot of people working in this field should print those out and put them up on their notice boards. Uh, I'd like now to call upon uh, Dr. Edwin Fulner, um, who is... Uh, I think it's fair to say a legend in Washington, D.C. He's the founder and president of the Heritage Foundation, which is the Institute for Conservative Policy Ideas um, and, and, and Implementation. He, he was the president for 37 years uh, and retired in 2013, but the foundation found they could not manage without him. So in a period of transition, he was called back to keep the ship headed in the right way um, while they figured out the future. He has a lifelong uh, connection with the Republic of Korea, has been honored by the Korean government uh, for his work in promoting uh, closer relations between the US and, um, and, and Korea. Uh, at the end of his remarks, he will introduce our, our final and keynote speaker, Dr. Hyunjin Preston Moon. Please welcome Dr. Edwin Fulner. Thank you very much, Mike, for that very kind introduction, overly generous introduction. I, uh, I am back, at least for the time being, at Heritage. But it was, it is wonderful to be here with so many old and new friends from Korea. 
We've, we have esteemed members from the National Assembly with us. We have representatives of Action for Korea United as one of our host groups. I was fortunate, very fortunate indeed, to meet with you earlier in Seoul in previous years. I also want to acknowledge my friend Preston Moon and longtime friend in the common cause of freedom and Korean unification. Other assembled co conveners, including the Global Peace Foundation, AKU, the East West Institute, One Korea Foundation, and guests from both the international community and from here in the United States. It's an historic time in the bilateral relationship. Just last week, our president, Donald J. Trump, and the ROK president, Moon Jae-in, had an historic summit meeting in Seoul for the first time in 25 years. And first time for a, a state visit, at least, from a U.S. president in 25 years. This important meeting affirmed that the longstanding ties that bind our countries and our people are as robust today as they have been in the historic past. A critical objective in addressing the current North Korean nuclear threat is to expand our alliance throughout the Indo-Pacific region as we work together to establish a lasting solution to this crisis. As many of you may know, during the last presidential transition, I had the pleasure and honor to work for candidate Donald Trump as one of his senior policy advisors. Since his election, I've had a number of unique private occasions to get together with the president again, including a special gathering just last month with the Heritage Foundation's annual President's Club here in Washington. Last week, I was delighted and encouraged to hear the president's forward-looking speech to all of you from the Korean National Assembly. I read that speech with great interest. I watched it live on television, and I was particularly moved when he elaborated and said, Korea stands strong and tall among the great community of independent, confident, and peace-loving nations. We affirm the dignity of every person and embrace the full potential of every soul. We are always prepared to defend the vital interests of our people against the cruel ambition of tyrants. Together, we dream of a Korea that is free, a peninsula that is safe, and families that are reunited once again. We dream of highways connecting north and south, of cousins embracing cousins, and this nuclear nightmare replaced with the beautiful promise of peace. Until that day comes, we stand strong and alert. Our eyes are fixed to the north and our hearts praying for the day when all Koreans can live in freedom. How fitting President Trump's words are for today's special forum. In previous forums, with Action for Korea United and the Global Peace Foundation, I observed the vibrant power of civil society engagements that Mike has mentioned before. Civil society to establish peace and security. Since its founding, my colleagues and I at the Heritage Foundation likewise have recognized the importance of civic engagement as it has worked for more than four decades to advance in America where freedom, opportunity, prosperity, and civil society flourish. Your grassroots people power approach is one that I had advocated some decades ago during my tenure as chairman of the U.S. Advisory Commission on Public Diplomacy under the presidencies of Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush. Well, as we work together through this international forum to establish freedom and peaceful reunification on the Korean Peninsula, it's inspiring to see the broad spectrum of participants that have been assembled here today. I'm confident this effort will elicit broad-based support throughout the citizenry, both here in the United States and in Korea as we use every avenue to disseminate information about this compelling vision and the power of freedom whose time has really come. 
Last year, I was honored and delighted to write the foreword to Preston Moon's inspiring book, Korean Dream, A Vision for a Unified Korea. I commend it to all of you as a compelling source of information on the historical foundation and the continuing strategic importance of a unified and a free Korea. Dr. Moon notes the centrality of the principles and the values entailed in his vision, which, like those of America's founding, are inalienable and God-given, and when championed through a citizen-led movement, are ultimately irrepressible. Indeed, President Trump summoned the international community to stand behind such an approach in his address to the Korean National Assembly in Seoul when he was welcomed by our distinguished co-panelists, Assemblyman Lee and Shin, representing both the governing and the minority parties. Ladies and gentlemen, it's now my very great pleasure to introduce for his keynote address, Dr. Hyunjin Preston Moon, founder and chairman of the Global Peace Foundation. I'd like to note, in light of the forthcoming Winter Olympics in the Republic of Korea, that there was a time not too long ago that Dr. Moon represented in a previous Summer Olympics Games in Seoul and Barcelona, the Republic of Korea in equestrian events, something that may not be known to all of you. The principal leadership that Dr. Moon is investing in realizing the vision of the Korean dream has also been reflected in his many philanthropic roles as well as in his deep devotion to faith and family. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Moon. Thank you, Dr. Fulner, for such a wonderful introduction and your very many insightful suggestions and nuggets of wisdom that have guided not only uh, the way in which I look at the world, but also in which um, the values and the principles, especially rooted in fundamental freedoms and human rights, have really made a change in this world. So. Let's give Ed a round of applause and all the great work that he has done at Heritage Foundation. <laughs> Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us at this important international forum on One Korea as we address the serious challenges posed by the crisis on the Korean Peninsula. Let me thank the co-conveners and partners that have joined the Global Peace Foundation in organizing this forum, including Action for Korea United, the East-West Institute, One Korea Foundation, and the Korean National Unification Advisory Council. I would like to recognize members of the National Assembly, in addition to the large delegation from Korea that represent Action for Korea United. Please join me in giving them a round of applause. We welcome, likewise, the many scholars and friends from across the globe who are here today in a common pursuit of peaceful Korean unification as the enduring solution to the pressing challenge before us. It is fitting that we meet today in the United States Capitol as we reflect on the long-standing friendship between the U.S. and the Korean people. Since the Korean War, our two peoples have shared a bond of blood, sweat, and tears, as well as the timeless principles and values rooted in the inalienable rights and freedoms given to us by our Creator. Yet the single-minded North Korean pursuit of a nuclear intercontinental ballistic missile program has become the most pressing issue affecting global peace and security. Addressing this urgent threat has become a top priority of U.S. foreign policy and has led to new levels of cooperation among nations in Asia, both allies and former adversaries. Pyongyang's 
provocations are a serious challenge to the global community, but also have presented us with a historic opportunity. To grasp that opportunity, we need to look beyond the denuclearization challenge and view Korea in a broader historical context. We must recall that the division of the Korean Peninsula arose out of the geopolitics of the Cold War and had nothing to do with the aspirations of the Korean people. That aspiration was to create a model nation which espoused fundamental human rights and freedoms unique to the historic and cultural experience of Korea. It was expressed most fully during the Samil March 1st independence movement of 1919, but was thwarted and left unfulfilled throughout the 20th century. But those dreams have not died. With the world's attention focused on the peninsula, the time is ripe to pursue an endgame strategy for the peaceful unification of Korea once and for all. All interim issues such as denuclearization would be addressed within that framework. Its achievement would guarantee global peace and security, opening the door to prosperity in the region and in the world. Most of all, it will fulfill the first step in realizing the Korean dream of creating a model nation among nations and poise the Korean people on the threshold of, fulfill of fulfilling their national destiny. Ladies and gentlemen, such an approach is articulated in my 2014 book called The Korean Dream, which outlines a vision for Korea's future rooted in its unique history and culture. I believe that it was the first treaties on unification that dealt with the issue from a historic philosophical perspective and challenged many assumptions that had dominated the academic and policy circles. It articulated the historic aspirations of the Korean people, rooted in its founding mythology 5,000 years ago. It showed how that aspiration shaped Korean history, culture, identity, and a sense of national destiny and how it developed and how it could develop into a dream that could unite all Koreans, even those in North and South today. Ladies and gentlemen, we should not underestimate, underestimate the impact and motivating power of a dream. In the opening cha first chapter of my book, I open up with a quote from Genghis Khan. If one person has a dream, it is just a dream. But if all people share that dream, it becomes a reality. From the outset, I knew that the confrontational nature of the Cold War framework would be a non-starter in seeking peaceful reconciliation. What was needed was a unifying dream that was uniquely Korean without the taint of foreign influence and intervention. All free, ethical, and prosperous nations are grounded in universal principles and undergird, that undergird their liberty and define our common humanity. These are transcendent truths that various cultures have described in their own way. For Americans, they are expressed in the Declaration of Independence, enshrining the principles that President Abraham Lincoln drew upon to challenge and finally abolish the institution of slavery through the Civil War, as well as, the, as, well as what the civil rights activist Martin Luther King Jr. hearkened to in his landmark speech, I Have a Dream. In my native Korea, these principles are embodied in an ideal that has been cherished for millennia, known as Hongik Ingan, which calls on the Korean people to fulfill a destiny of living for the benefit of humanity. Throughout Korean history, the Hongik Ingan ideal has served as a touchstone 
of aspiration, principles, and values that shaped the spiritual consciousness of the Korean people and guided them in times of crisis. Koreans today need to draw upon that common ideal that long predates the conflicting ideologies since 1945. It alone provides the basis of a shared destiny and cultural values that form the unique Korean identity and thereby has the power to rejuvenate it. It is the only guiding vision that has the historic and cultural legitimacy to bridge the ideological divide, the political divide, the economic divide, as well as the national divide on the peninsula, and build a peaceful future for all Koreans. Korean self-determination should be a guiding principle. Korean history did not begin in 1945 with the collapse of Japan. Before it was absorbed into the larger Japanese empire during the turn of the 20th century, it was an ancient civilization with a history that spanned five millennia. With the end of World War II, the two dominant world powers, the United States and the Soviet Union, divided the peninsula into zones of influence, propping up their client regimes in the South and North, respectively. The division was never meant to be a permanent division, but a temporary stopgap measure until national elections in 1948. Those elections were never held. Instead, two separate Korean governments were established that reflected the ideological divide between the U.S. and the USSR. The Korean War was a product of the North's effort to unify the peninsula by force, since unity had always been the desired outcome of both Koreas ever since liberation from Japan. Contextualizing Korea's future in its founding ideals removes all the foreign constructs that have defined the last century, such as colonialism and the Cold War, and allows the Korean people to take charge of their own destiny, rooted in their unique history. Today, Koreans will need, to, need the support of the international community in their efforts to bring unification. But at the heart of this process, it should be Korean-led. On one level, Korean-led involves efforts of the two Korean governments, but more importantly, it also suggests a bottom-up approach that seeks the active engagement, participation, and leadership of the Korean people themselves. It is the Korean people in the South, North, and diaspora that are the most important stakeholders in the movement for unification and therefore should be the driving force behind that process. Anchored in the Republic of Korea, the movement will extend to the Korean diaspora and eventually to those living in the North. Action for Korea United, an organization that I launched in 2012 in Seoul, Korea, was meant to realize this Korean-led vision. In just five years, it has grown to be the largest citizen-based coalition for unification, encompassing every sector of South Korean society. The more than 850 members and partners include the major faith communities, human rights groups, civic and humanitarian aid relief organizations, corporations, media, student groups, academic institutions, NGOs, political parties, and the South Korean government. The creation of AKU came from hard-won lessons learned during the sunshine policy of the Kim Dae-jun and Ro moon hyun administrations. The liberal policy of engagement with the North seemed attractive on the surface since it was a clear departure from the conservative Cold War outlook of previous presidents that sought the destruction of the Kim regime. But in its implementation, this policy had no definable endgame and left many wondering what was the purpose and outcome of engagement. The lack of clarity doomed the sunshine policy to failure with subsequent dire consequences, since it led to the fund funding of the North's nuclear program. 
as a, as a Korean deeply committed to the unification of my homeland. It was a hard but clear lesson that the obstacles for unification did not reside with the North, but with the South. The amazing opportunity to engage and lead the North towards unification was squandered in a malaise of token gestures, indecision, but most importantly, lack of clarity. To make matters worse, many South Korean actors actively competed, competed against each other to curry favor with the Kim regime, creating a gold rush atmosphere where the North played one off the other to their financial benefit. These lessons showed that any future engagement with the North will require South Korean and the international community to be clear on the desired outcome of peaceful unification. The need to create AKU came directly from the lessons learned through these experiences. It is an effort to build clarity and unity in the South's policy of engagement, as well as advocate a consensus-building vision for the creation of a new nation acceptable to all Koreans. That vision is the Korean dream. Ladies and gentlemen, although the Cold War entered almost ended almost three decades ago, it is all too easy for government officials and policy experts to fall back into existing, these existing frameworks. This was the downfall of the six-party talks in which participants retreated all too easily into their old Cold War lineups. It is time to move beyond that paradigm and embrace fresh approaches that reflect the real changing dynamics of the region. The geopolitics of the region dramatically has changed from 30 years ago. China no longer stands in the shadows of a larger Soviet empire and is currently driven by its own global ambition for hegemony in the region and the world. Both China and Russia reformed their economies along Western models and have engaged in trade with their former adversaries, such as the United States, South Korea, and Japan, at levels that were unheard of a decade ago, let alone three decades ago. Their foreign policy agendas for the region and global dominance make China and Russia geopolitical competitors as much as rivals with the United States and its allies. The divisive ideology, ideological worldview that shaped this region during the Cold War has given way to economic integration. The global economy has merged the collective futures of former rivals in Northeast Asia in unprecedented ways since this region's prosperity is built and fueled by the trade and domestic economies of the United States, China, Japan, South Korea, and Russia. In this ever-changing environment, North Korea stands as the last vestige of the Cold War. It remains a serious impediment to the prosperity and, with its nuclear program, the security of the region. China and Russia are beginning to rethink their commitment to the North. In fact, the highly publicized state execution of Kim Jong-un's uh, Jong uncle Chang Song Tek, and later the assassination of his eldest brother, King Jam Nam, suggest strained relations between North, the North and China, as both men were known to be pro Chinese members of that regime. Unlike his grandfather and father, the younger Kim is alienating the North's traditional Cold War allies and strengthening new alliances, especially with rogue regimes like Iran. Therefore, it is in the interest of the United States and South Korea to engage with other nations beyond the old six-party lines that are beginning to have influence in Asia. One such nation is India. During the, Cold War, during the Korean War, India remained a neutral party under its non-alignment policy when UN forces intervened in the peninsula. Until recently, 
India was one of the North's largest trading partners and major food aid provider with diplomatic and trade relations with both Koreas. Yet, little is mentioned about the strategic importance of India in dealing with the peninsular issue, especially in the policy circles of the US and the ROK. In addition, important contributions can be made by other nations that have diplomatic relations with both the South and North Korea. Mongolia, for example, once firmly in the communist camp, has peacefully transitioned to a democratic system. It could serve as an example of what may be possible in North Korea. Ladies and gentlemen, Korean patriots sought to free themselves from Japanese colonial rule, inspired by the, by the section on self-determination in President Woodrow Wilson's 14 points, thinking there would be global support for their initiative. They created a declaration of independence that was proclaimed in peaceful rallies throughout the country in March 1st, 1919. These gatherings mobilized more than two million Koreans and inspired other nations striving to unshackle the yoke of colonialism. colonialism. Yet, tragically, their appeal fell on deaf ears among the victors in Paris and triggered increasingly harsh Japanese repression of Korean cultural identity. My family has been intimately involved in the Korean people's struggle for freedom, and I am proud of the roles that they have played. My great-granduncle, Reverend Yun Kuk Moon, was one of the founding architects of the Declaration and the Movement for Independence in Korea in 1910, 1919. My father, the Reverend Dr. Sun Myung Moon, was imprisoned for his involvement in this movement while studying in Japan. After liberation from Japan, he began his ministry in Pyongyang and was imprisoned for three years in a North Korean death camp in Hungnam until he was freed by UN forces in the fall of 1950. Most importantly, he pioneered the opening to North Korea through his groundbreaking meeting with Kim Il-sung in 1991. During that historic meeting, my father challenged the Chuche ideology upon which the Kim regime uh, is built and emphasize the need to move towards a peaceful unification of the peninsula. Among the points raised in that informal discussion was that North Korea should not become a nuclear state. Kim Il-sung expressed an openness to, for closer relations with the South, but the possibilities raised never bore fruit because of the innate divisions and lack of an end game vision within the South. That is why we have to recognize what a historic moment we live today. President Trump's leadership in tackling the North's nuclear ambition and galvanizing global action and opinion against the Kim regime is bringing the crisis on, a, on the peninsula to a new level of international recognition and attention. For the first time in U.S. history, America has, made, has an activist policy towards the North, making it clear that denuclearization of Korea is its main priority and that every option is left on the table. This position of strength and its emphasis on the crisis in Korea, above all other foreign policy issues, is a stark departure from every other administration going all the way back to the Truman administration. Yet to this day, many in the US still look at the Korean crisis through the lens of the Cold War. Many see the division of the peninsula as a larger struggle of opposing systems and ideologies. Ironically, that division was never the desire of the Korean people after liberation from Japan, but the outcome of the many failures in U.S. foreign policy. It failed to acknowledge the aspiration of an oppressed people during the March 1st independence movement of 1919, although it was the idealistic vision of President Woodrow Wilson 
14 points that inspired it. It allowed the Soviet Union to enter the war in the Pacific and eventually have a foothold on the peninsula, although it had defeated the Japanese Empire unilaterally. It participated in the partitioning of the peninsula into zones of influence that later led to the two separate governments of North and South. Finally, it did not unite the peninsula during the Korean War and agree to the current armistice along the 38th parallel. The current crisis on the peninsula is a direct result of the historic American inaction and ignorance about the peninsula. However, President Trump's recent Asia tour suggests a renewed commitment to the region and most of all, to Korea. For most of US history, Korea has been an afterthought. Other geopolitical factors, issues, and conflicts made the North Korean threat a tertiary issue throughout most of the second half of the 20th and the beginning of the 21st century. Yet with the North's development of nuclear weapons and now its delivery systems to strike the US and its ter territories, the current administration is making the Korean crisis the centerpiece of its foreign policy. Under this geo changing geopolitical context, South Korea will be hosting the 2018 Winter Olympic Games. Interestingly, 2018 marks the 30th anniversary of the Seoul Olympic Games, where athletes from both the West and the Soviet bloc meet for the first time since the boycotts of the 1980 games by the US and its allies, and the boycotts of the 1984 games by the USSR and its allies. In addition to the Olympics, that year marked the birth of the South Korean democracy and the end of the military dictatorship, closing a painful chapter in the history of the South. The following year, 2019, marks the 30th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall the iconic symbol of the Cold War that separated the West from the Soviet bloc. But for Koreans, it marks the centennial of the Korean independence movement of 1919 that captured the aspirations of the Korean people throughout the 20th century. It reminds us of the yet unrealized hopes of those earlier independence pioneers and inspires us to constructive action, to finally fulfill their ideals and dreams to create a unified, sovereign, independent nation that could be the model to the world for the betterment of all mankind. That is why the Global Peace Foundation and Action for Korea United has launched the One Korea Global Campaign that seeks to spread the Korean dream vision of unification, and national destiny to all Koreans in the South, the North, the dias and the diaspora throughout the year of 2018. The culminating event will be held in March of 2019 in Seoul, Korea to commemorate the centennial of the Samil Movement for Independence. It will feature the Global Peace Convention and all affiliated projects and programs supporting the work of unification. In addition, this initiative, through gatherings such as this forum, is promoting a new paradigm among academics and policy experts on Korea so that their respective governments can partner with the Korean people in their drive for self-determination and unification. I'm happy to report that prominent scholars of the International Advisory Council for Korean Unification and the Northeast Asia Peace and Development are already developing a roadmap inspired by the Korean dream. Yet more of these kinds of developments are necessary if real change is to happen. And this global initiative will provide the platform to make this possible. In addition to engaging academic and policy circles, the One Korea Global Campaign will promote Kore the Korean dream through entertainment and cultural exhibitions. Already, the 1K concert series has become a regional phenomenon, and we, can, and we plan on expanding this initiative globally. This project was launched in 2015 
to commemorate the 70th year anniversary of Korean liberation from Japan with a mega K-pop concert in Seoul. With this event, a new genre of popular music was developed to engage the youth on the relevance of unification. The top entertainers of K-pop and, and its most accomplished producers and composers in the industry contributed to the, the creative efforts in this cause. Just this past spring, the 1K concert was held in Manila, Philippines, in conjunction with the Global Peace Convention. This concert drew more than 15,000 youth and was the talk of the town in Manila, showing that the theme of unification is not only relevant to Koreans, but to all Asians. They, there, they were proud to debut to the a global audience the new Korean dream song written by Grammy award-winning award producers Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis and perform, performed by award-winning artists Dami Im and Peebo Bryson. This song will be the anthem for unification to a new generation of young people around the world and will culminate in a major concert in Korea in March of, 19, of 2019. In addition to the 1K concert series, other cultural and education-based initiatives will make the unification agenda known to a wider global public. One such project is the creation and launching of a documentary film on the Korean dream that presents the key themes of my book. It will especially highlight the importance of the Samil movement for independence, not only to Koreans, but to all colonized people during that period of world history. The global premiere of that movie will coincide with all the events planned in Korea in March of 2019. It is important to note that although these larger projects will get much attention and will drive global interest, the vital work of the AKU partners in building grassroots consensus among the Korean people is where the proverbial rubber meets the road. Their contributions in humanitarian assistance, education, philanthropy, cultural arts, media, and many others is the foundation upon which this global initiative is built. I would like to personally invite you and anyone interested in Korean unification to become a part of this historic One Korea global campaign. And together with GPF and AKU to honor the 100th year anniversary of the March 1st movement at GPF's Gold Peace Convention in March 1st, 2019. Ladies and gentlemen, we stand at a historical, we stand at a historical inflection point where history, circumstance, and dreams unfulfilled are converging it, to create a perfect storm that can transform the landscape on the peninsula, Northeast Asia, and the world in profound ways. The Korean dream encapsulates the Hongi Ingan ideal that informed the aspirations of the Korean people to create a model nation that could realize their destiny to serve all humanity. This ideal was the DNA that became the foundation of our unique Korean history, culture, and identity. The division of the peninsula was an imposed foreign construct outside of that history, culture, and identity. The change in US policy towards North Korea is building awareness that did not exist before. This heightened awareness, especially when married to the One Korea Global Campaign that GPF and AKU will be launching to commemor commemorate the centennial of the Samil independence movement of 1919 will be a powerful force for change. Given the, given the anniversaries of historic milestones that represented friendship and freedom, as well as the dreams of self-determination and destiny in 2018 and 2019, respectively, I truly believe that we are at a historic, providential moment when amazing things could happen. Now is the time for far-reaching vision and bold action. Korea's historical quest 
for one free, independent, sovereign nation is within reach. As a nation established on the ideal of benefiting all humanity, Korea can stand as an, as an example to the world. By surmounting the remnants of colonialism and the Cold War divisions on the peninsula, the Korean people can attain their historical aspiration and help others attain the global dream of one family under God. May God bless you all, and may God bless this noble endeavor. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Moon, uh, for that very thoughtful and uh, uh, probing presentation. Uh, you presented to us uh, the importance of the moment in which we live, the opportunity there. Uh, you laid out a vision uh, that can take advantage of this moment, and you detailed some of the practical steps that are already underway among uh, civil society groups and citizen-led organizations uh, to bring this change about. Uh, so once again, I think uh, this is a presentation that will repay a great deal of study. Let's give one more round of applause to Dr. Moon.